How are you folks? My name is Kalpin Modi. I'm one of the associate directors here at the White House Office of Public Engagement. Uh, I'm also the president's liaison to young Americans. And we're here today with a, a special session of Facebook DC Live uh, from the White House's conference on bullying prevention. Um, now, every day, uh, thousands of kids, teens, and, and young adults are, uh, are bullied around the country. And the estimates uh, are that nearly a third of all school-aged children are bullied each school year. That's upwards of 13 million uh, students. And cyberbullying specifically presents a new challenge when we think about bullying prevention. Cyberbullying can, can occur 24-7 certainly and to a wide audience and it really gives those who engage in that behavior a, a false sense of anonymity. So we're going to be spending 40 minutes today uh, taking questions from you through the Facebook community. Uh, so you can send your questions. We'll answer as many of them as we can. Uh, you can go to uh, the uh, White House Facebook page. You can also email the questions at facebookdclive at fb. Dot com. Now I'm going to get started by introducing our panelists and then we'll, we'll jump right in. I'm going to read so I don't get anyone's titles wrong. But uh, to my right is Joe Sullivan. Joe is a uh, Facebook Chief Security <coughs> Officer and he's a former federal pro uh, prosecutor, a founding member of the Justice, Justice Department's Computer Hacking and Intellectual Properties Units and he oversees uh, safety and security of uh, Facebook's more than 500 million active users. Uh, to Joe's right, uh, we have Rosalind Wiseman. Uh, she is an internationally recognized expert on teens, parenting, and bullying. Uh, and her book, Queen Bees and Wannabes, was the basis for, uh, I think, one of some of our favorite movies, Mean Girls. Uh, and her follow-up book addresses uh, the social hierarchies and conflicts among, uh, amongst parents. Uh, Jason Rezepka is uh, MTV's Vice President of Public Affairs. He's responsible for really marshalling MTV's forces to engage and activate America's youth on the biggest challenges that are facing our generation. And uh, Jason, MTV's uh, social responsibility campaign addressing bullying issues is a thin line? Mm -hmm. Thin line, all right. And Melody Barnes is joining us uh, over there on the end. Melody, uh, Melody I'm sorry, is the, the President's Domestic Policy Advisor and Director of the Domestic Policy Council, which coordinates the uh, domestic policy making process here at the White House. Um, and let's, with that, just dive into uh, your questions. We've got the first question here from a seventh grader in Maryland. Her name is uh, Brianna, and she says, what is the definition of cyberbullying, and what would be a fair consequence for schools to implement for incidents of cyberbullying? Uh, and also the follow-up question to that is, is there a legal distinction between cyberbullying and face-to-face -face bullying? Who wants to tackle that one? I, th I think quite simply, cyberbullying <coughs> is traditional bullying, but using technology. So it's expanding the environment and ex expanding the, the means through which that bullying might take place. But the underlying behavior that we're trying to address is exactly the same uh, that we're trying to address offline. Anyone else? Uh, I guess that to go even further, to talk about our a campaign from, from MTV called The Thin Line, we've looked at it in a little bit of a, a wider context. And, and looked at this issue as digital abuse. So looking at all the ways that technology can be used to make someone's life miserable. And that can be on a cell phone, that can be on a computer, and it can be in myriad different ways. Uh, but I think we're interested in casting this as abuse because part of the issue is we've gotten hung up on bullying is something, it's a rite of passage, people grow up with it. Um, and, and many people have the view that, that you know, it's, it's something that you deal with as a kid. In casting it as abuse, we're looking at this as something that is unacceptable, that, that there's zero tolerance for, uh, and that we address these abusive behaviors and empower young people to lead the way. So I think as far as consequences go, um, the, at, at the legal level and the state and federal levels, there's people are grappling with what are the proper consequences. Schools are grappling with that. It feels like the most important uh, idea there is that we go to and empower young people to be on the front lines of this and supporting each other uh, and sticking up for their friends and, and being able to, to resolve these, these issues themselves as much as possible. Yeah, I'd like to follow up um, because I cannot agree more that this is an issue that, yes, adults are going to know about it, but at the same time, it's young people that it's happening to that you are going to be the people who make the difference to stop this. <clears throat> So, and that means that, you know, sometimes people say who look like me, who look like some of the people up here, you know, if you get a bad email or you get a bad text, just don't walk away, just walk away. Well, that is really hard. And I want to say to the people who are, who've had this happen to them and you're watching this, I get that, and I think everybody here gets that it's really hard to just walk away or not press send. And it is really tempting because you feel like somebody has done something horrible to you and you feel like you want to get back at them or you want to find out why they're doing this to you. And so one of the things I just want you know, to really think about is, is I don't think that f trying to figure out how to solve this problem online is going to work. 
I think the way you solve this problem is you actually get the skills to face the person safely face to face because you're never gonna be able to solve a problem on Facebook this way. It's just gonna to get to this place where you feel like you can't sleep, you can't do anything, but like figure out like what happened to me and why. So I think that's why we're all here today is to be able to figure out like how can we give you the skills and how can we all give ourselves the skills to do something different? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just to piggyback on what Rosalind was saying, you know, one of the things that we were able to do today is to hear from students. Um, and in fact, the president and the first lady met with two sisters who started writing about this um, and, and wrote a book about the kind of bullying that they saw taking place around them with their peers. Um, so that empowerment discussion that we were just having I think is very, very important. At the same time, we want to make sure that teachers and coaches and other adults in a school environment are aware of what's happening, including when it's happening and it's cyberbullying, um, so that we can make sure that they can address the problem because we know it can really affect a way that you or another Another young person can perform in school. We've seen grades go down, we've seen people becoming fearful of going to school, people who no longer like going to school. So we want to make sure that the entire environment, that students are empowered to try and address this issue, but also the, the adults are around are aware of what's happening so that they can start to address it as well. I'm really excited about something we're launching at, at Facebook today, which is this idea of social reporting around bullying. Um, if you think about the history of content online and if you saw something that was harmful to you, how do you respond to it? Um, well, for one, you would like that website to take it down. And, and we want to be there and, and respond as, as Facebook uh, to remove that content. But we also want to encourage individuals to stand up and to share that bad content with someone in their life that they think can help them. So that's the new flow that we launched today. The idea is when you go to report something on Facebook and say, I think this is bullying, we're going, to, we're going to say three things. One, if, you, if this is a life-threatening situation, get law enforcement involved right away. Second of all, though, is there someone in your community you want to share this with? Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, historically, you'd have to uh, you know, write, cl you know, click on your screen, figure out how to save it, attach it to an email, and send it to someone. And that kind of process would get in the way. Now you'll be able to, with just entering their email address or their Facebook ID, um, send that um, content over to them. On the other side, we're also challenging the person who posted it. Instead of us just removing the content and sending you a note saying, I've removed that, we, you know, we, we Facebook took down something you posted. We're actually gonna send you a message that shows you your own words and say, do you wanna take this down? Uh, challenge you to think about what you posted. And we, we've done some testing already, but we're very excited to see where it will go, how, how communities will respond and, and we're really grateful the, to the advice that we've gotten from the experts, and we're going to need to continue to get as we kind of create even further social engagement on these issues. So some of the trends we're hearing is, is obviously prevention, raising awareness, some of the great work that the administration's doing, Melody, that, that, uh, that you've been working on, and then a lot of the solutions. And uh, Jason talked about uh, empowerment um, of young people and kind of what, what kids can do themselves. So we've got a question from uh, a fourth grade class in Chicago uh, who's joining us right now. And they're asking, what behavior is actually defined bullying? And the follow-up to that is that sometimes we get confused about how mean or playful behaviors can become bullying. Um, yeah, I'd like to address that. Um, I think that, let, let's look at it this way. Conflict is inevitable among people. You are going to have conflict. And you need to know, every human being needs to know how, how, no matter how old they are, how to be able to speak when you're intimidated or you feel like you're about to lose your words or someone is just coming at you with a lot of words. The other part that's also unfortunately inevitable is that abuse of power in a conflict is inevitable. Somebody is, at some point in your life, even by fourth grade, you're going to have a situation where somebody does something to you that makes you feel small. And if you take the word bullying and you sort of strip it away of what it really is about, what it really is about is someone saying to you, you don't have the right to speak. You don't have the right to speak because you're a different skin color than me. You look differently than I do. Um, you are just somebody that I don't think of as equal to me. So I have the right to degrade you. I have the right to ridicule you. I have the right to do something online and think it's funny, but it's ridiculing or humiliating to you, and then share it with everybody else. Those are things that, that's what bullying looks like. So it's not just about, you know, kids being friends or kids, you know, being nice to each other. This is about at base, even in fourth grade, even in kindergarten, that people have the right, no matter what, to be treated with dignity. 
and to have their voice and not to be silenced. No matter who they are, no matter what they look like, no matter where they come from, everybody has the right to speak. And if you don't, and if you are silenced, then you are being bullied. And I think a good point that uh, Rosalind was just making is the fact that bullying can be both verbal and it can be physical. Um, and it, it can be someone literally touching you or hurting you, um, but it also can be someone saying something about you um, to others and then all of a sudden sharing that, whether it's by right. on, uh, online or by texting, or it can be someone um, who's saying something to you that's intimidating. So both of those are very, very critical right. elements. Mm -hmm. From the standpoint of, um, I think the, the questioner was, how do, how do I make sure that my, my communications are not bullying? Uh, I think the president made a very important point this morning in the dialogue about remembering the golden rule. Uh, you know, think about if you were at the other side of the comments that you're about to make, uh, the actions you're about to take, and kind of flip things around before you act, or think before you act is a really good starting point. This has been a really important topic for us to inform the campaign, and even the campaign name, A Thin Line, uh, reflects the fact that there's a thin line between innocent and, in, and inappropriate. So there's a thin line between words and wounds. There's things that, that you may express that you don't mean in a mean-spirited way, but because of the dynamics of, of the internet and, on, and online where things can quickly accelerate and, uh, and, and be magnified, that something that starts out innocent can very easily become uh, hurtful and harmful. And so what we've tried to do is not necessarily give rules to young people to say, like, this is right and this is wrong, but to empower them to come to that conclusion themselves. Where are you gonna draw your line between digital use and digital abuse? Uh, we have an app that we've created called Over the Line that actually is exactly a place to have this conversation where we're asking young people to upload examples of digital drama. So like where you have experienced something or where you've maybe sent a message that you felt went too far and then asking a community of young people to weigh in and say, did this cross the line? Did this go over the line? Uh, and again, I think taking it back to those ways that we can uh, support America's youth in coming to these conclusions themselves, making these decisions themselves, uh, feels like there will be uh, a long-term uh, great benefit to that. So, um, I, I just wanted to add one thing, which is that you know I work with a lot of different kids who are targets, bystanders, bullies. It's really rare for bullies to think that they are bullying. They often think that they are in the right, that something happened to them or somebody did something to them that is justifying what they did. So they don't feel insecure. They don't feel like you know, they wake up and go, wow, I'm a really mean person. They think that they are in the right. And so one of the things I would ask, based on you know, what my panelists are talking about, is when something bad happens to you or when you get frustrated, when you get angry at somebody, and it's that stepping over the line, the question to ask yourself is, am I treating this person with dignity when it's hard? It's easy to treat people with dignity when it's easy and you like people. Mm -hmm. But when people do something that's mean to you or you perceive it to be wrong, that is the moment when really your dignity matters and that you have to treat people this way. Otherwise, it's just, it doesn't work, right? It, it just, it has to be the case where what your values are enforced and they're enacted when you really maybe don't want to and you want to go over the line. And, but you decide and you look at yourself and you say, wait a minute, this isn't right. This is hard, I'm gonna take ownership when it's hard. And I think that's really when it counts and when you are mindful and in control of your own behavior. So we're getting a couple of questions here um, that deal with sort of uh, folks who are looking for guidance on, on some of the actionable items. So what can they actually do? And I'm gonna read a couple of them because there are quite a few that are coming in. Um, one is, when my daughter was the victim of cyberbullying in seventh grade, I was told that nothing could be done because the kids were minors. So what can be done to strengthen laws to protect kids and hold their parents responsible? Similarly, uh, we have a question here. Some girls started a gay and lesbian alliance club at my granddaughter's high school, and now they're being bullied. There's been coverage on the local news uh, by one of the girls telling her story, but she's saying that the school is not helping her. So what can we do uh, to help? Um, and then uh, you know, a question about, um, or a comment rather, not a lot of children who are, uh, who are bullied are brave enough or capable uh, of reaching out uh, to help somebody because they're too concerned of getting uh, hurt themselves. So th those are sort of the, the issues that folks are looking for guidance on. Do you guys have any, have any responses to that? Sure. Well, first of all, one of the things we want to make sure and to encourage students to do is to go to an adult in the school environment Go to a teacher, talk to your coach, the principal, the assistant principal, the guidance counselor, and let them know what's happening to you or what may be happening um, to a peer. And those adults 
should be able to and ready to receive that information. You know, one of the things that Secretary Arne Duncan did, and he's Secretary of Education um, here at the Department of Education, is that he and the, de the department are providing technical assistance in to local communities as they think about their laws and ways to um, strengthen their laws as communities want to take this issue on. And the department also issued guidance um, in the form of a dear colleague letter to school systems to let teachers and other adults know about the responsibilities they have because we want to make sure that you and your peers are feeling safe in your classrooms. There was a lot of questions there. Could you say them again? There were, sure, yeah. <laughs> um, so th that, that was actually great guidance, I think, for the folks that were looking on, uh, for, for what to do if you're being bullied. Um, I think the other one was uh, a, bit more, a bit more legal, which was um, that some folks were being told that there was nothing that could be done because the kids were, were minors. Um, you know, especially for you, I think you've worked in the law enforcement you know, side of that. Is there validity to that? I think more than 40 of the 50 states have, cyber, uh, have bullying laws on the books. Um, but you know, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, do we think that we, law enforcement should be injecting into these uh, situations? Sometimes the answer is yes. Probably the vast majority of the time the answer is no. And that there's a, more of an opportunity for school leaders and parents and the rest of the community to play an important role here. I, I really like the way uh, the work uh, Rosalind has done around uh, the role of the bystander. And to me, that, that just as, a, you know, working at a place where we think about bringing people together and connecting, the idea that the observer who laughs is a facilitator of the bad conduct, but the observer who stands up and walks away or, you know, raises their concerns, even indirectly later. There's so many opportunities for us as a society to challenge the bystanders or encourage the bystander to, to be a good Samaritan. Right. And there's one thing I do want to clarify, though. When Secretary Duncan and the Department of Education sent this Dear Colleague letter to school systems, it was to inform the adults in the education um, environment, teachers and school leaders, principals, assistant principals, about their obligation to address this issue. Um, because we know that it can really undermine someone's ability to learn in school. So this goes, it moves away from uh, the new laws and the laws that the states may have passed to saying to teachers and others, these are the things that you are responsible for in your classroom to make sure that students are safe and able to learn. Um, I'd, I'd like to give um, the students and the, or the kids and uh, young people and the teachers watching this my suggestions about how to address these issues that you're raising. Um, so if you're thinking about reporting, and the way I d um, define reporting versus snitching is, snitching is you want to make the problem bigger and more public. And reporting is you actually want to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about that and you think about, well, I want to go talk to an adult. Well, I want you to think about who is the best adult. Because unfortunately, with what's going on in schools nowadays, entire counseling departments are getting wiped out. School resource officers, uh, they're a half of what they used to be. And so one of the things that I want you to think about if you're a kid watching this is, OK, if I want to report, report this, what are the three characteristics that I want to have an adult that I go talk to? Do I want that person to like, listen to me and not be judgmental, not freak out on me? Do I want him or her, do I want him to really be able to think through with me how to solve the problem? So I want you to think about what are the three qualities that you're looking for in this ally? And then I want you to think about who is the person in your school that can be this ally for you? So you go there with already a, like a, a defined list of what you need. And I also want you to think about it is not weak to ask for help from an adult. I know that it's this feeling of like, I want to be able to handle this on my own. But you know what? Sometimes every one of us, I bet at this table, has been in a situation where it's just too big to solve on your own. So you have to be, it's not weak. It's not weak to ask for help. And for the adults listening to this, I think what's most important is if a kid comes to you, you don't have to be the counselor. But what I would suggest you say is three things. You say, I'm really sorry this happened to you. Thank you for telling me. And together, we're going to think this through and I'm gonna be there with you every step of the way. That's great advice. Um, just a reminder, if folks are joining us uh, now, um, you can email your questions uh, to facebookdclive at fb.com. Um, and this next series of questions, again, following uh, um, some of the trends here, uh, Jasmine is asking, why do kids bully in the first place? Um, and why do bullied kids do the things that they do to take revenge? I just talked, so I think. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I mean, it, this is uh, age old. I mean, it goes back to the dawn of time. So there's always been conflict um, and we're always going to, to deal with that. So I think it's, a lot of it comes down to, to social norms. And I think the way that we, um, as a community, if it's in a school, if it's in a community more broadly, um, through the actions of parents and the, and the, the role models that, uh, that they play for their children, um, in really having a zero tolerance environment uh, and having a, a zero tolerance view uh, and, and being completely upfront about the fact that it's not acceptable. And, and I think, again, supporting kids in finding the best ways that they can start that process uh, in, in addressing these these conflict situations that they face. Um, we've heard many instances where a parent finds out and they immediately want to go and confront the other child's parents. And in many instances that can make it much worse. So I think we, there, there's levels of escalation where we start with supporting young people and resolving these issues on the front lines and, uh, and having the best decision making skills possible and supporting them in that growth. Uh, and then there are critical thresholds we hit where it has to be escalated to administrators and, and all the way to uh, police and, and local law enforcement when it, when it gets to that level. So um, certainly the, the trends of, uh, of dealing with anything online raise issues of privacy. And we have a couple of questions here, um, I think most strongly uh, indicated by Kathy McKenzie's question. She asks, it seems like texting and Facebook gives bullies the chance to publish hateful words and name calling and make them more widely known than bullying done in person. At the same time, it seems like that should make it easier to detect. What tips do you have to help teachers and parents spot cyberbullying without invading a child's privacy? Uh, you, I, have, I have very, like, my opinions about this are changing, so I want to hear what everybody sure. else has okay. to say first. I, so <laughs> I've spent a lot of time talking to parents and teens about Facebook and how parents and teens should interact on Facebook. And the number one question I get from parents is, uh, should I become friends with my teen on Facebook? And then a uh, trustee, a third-party organization that does surveys around online trust, it recently came out with some study results, and they, they looked, they interviewed uh, thousands and thousands of teens, and what they reported back was that 86% whose parents were on Facebook had become Facebook friends. That, that really reinforced for me the idea that parents were engaging with their teens on Facebook and was exactly the kind of message I wanted to hear. And I, I think that parenting is an individual, you know, there are many individual decisions that go into parenting that, you know, I'm a parent and I choose to do certain things one way that my next door neighbor does very differently, and both are okay. And the same thing with, with parental engagement with their teens online. Um, I, I know with my kids, they, I have different levels of trust in different environments, and with one, I might tell her that uh, I need to have your Facebook password, and another, I might tell her, uh, I just want to be Facebook friends, and another I might tell, um, uh, you know, I, w I want to talk to you every time you go online. But that's, that's based on the parental decision and dialogue, and seeing that parents and teens are friends on Facebook is, is really encouraging, because one thing from our earlier discussion, we really need parents to understand the technology. You cannot give good advice and be supportive if you're talking about something you're not familiar with. We, we're, we all think about, uh, when my kids were two, I explained about stepping off the curb onto the street, and, and when they're older, I taught them how to put their own seatbelt on, and when they get older, I'm gonna let them drive a car. And so at, at different stages, I've been imposing different safety standards on them and having a dialogue that layers on, and for parents, that's really important around the online environment. I, I have a thought that I've, I've, been think, I've been thinking about this. I changed my mind about some of these things, you know, about my advice, you know, because I really think about stuff and I change my mind and I think, oh, you know. So, for example, three years ago, like, I thought that firewalls at schools were a great idea to block, you know, to block yeah. things so people couldn't get on, you know, Facebook during the school day so they could focus or any of the YouTube, things like that. But now I think that... Um, ever since everybody has phones, 85% of kids, I believe, have phones, and most of them have the Facebook app on their phone, then with, if they're going to abuse it, they're going to be doing it with their phone, and then the counselor can't get online at the school because it's blocked, right? So I, I basically am at the place where I feel like firewalls are irrelevant in schools, even though we might not want to admit that. That's, that's sort of where I'm at. Similarly, 
um, and I don't know what you think about this, I'd be interested to know, um, that I don't feel like if you're social networking, I don't think you have a lot of privacy. And I think that that's actually an unrealistic expectation. And so I'm wondering, and this is something I'm wondering, if you want privacy, then have a journal that you have in your room and write like old school, go old school, <laughs> and, write, and write a journal and put it under your mattress. And parents, I don't think you should be looking at that. But I don't think you're, I don't, I think we're at the place where I'm not sure that we have a lot of privacy or the expectation of privacy is one that's based on actual common sense and reality. I think that's a really good point. And the idea of Facebook is, is not a private journal. The whole point of going on Facebook is to connect with other people and to, and to communicate with them. So it's, if it's something that you don't want the people that you've connected with on Facebook to know about, then you shouldn't put it on Facebook and you should think about, you should think about those thoughts that belong in a journal and, and you probably shouldn't put them online. What we've seen in terms of, of what people put on Facebook, um, with teens we limit the visibility of their, the information to, to their friends, so um, it's really that community that they've chosen to open up to that sees their content. And an interesting thing is, uh, when you think about online, there are different environments. There's an environment that's similar to uh, the schoolyard where there's no adult supervision, and then there are environments where the entire class and the teacher are watching. And what we've seen is that the Facebook environment has become a lot more like that environment where you're standing in front of your class, and so there is usually someone who will stand up and say, hey, you know, that comment, maybe you should take that down. And just one last really quick point. Sure. I think beyond the privacy piece and the way that you are monitoring what your kids are doing online or not, and we know a lot of young people have two Facebook accounts, one for parents and one for everybody else. Oh, yeah. But I think even more important <laughs> is making sure that that your children know that if you come to them with an issue and it has to do with cyberbullying, that you're not going to immediately take away the phone or the computer because that's almost ensuring that they're not going to tell you. Right. That's a really important yeah, consideration. I, I was just two nights ago talking to a friend who said her 12-year-old, she had him set up her Facebook account so she could go online and, and uh, be Facebook friends with him. And she's like, what am I doing? <laughs> He's got the password now. But in any case, um, I think undergirding all of this is mm -hmm the parent-child relationship. And one of the things that we want to do, and we think it's really important, is to provide parents with resources. And one of the partnerships that we announced today was also one that included the PTA, that's really working hard to talk to parents about technology, about the issue of bullying, help them better understand it so they can also better uh, engage with their kids and, and develop a conversation, understand the language so that they can hear about these problems and help guide their children through them. So something that we're seeing is a widespread agreement with all of you that folks put too much information on their, on their Facebook pages. <laughs> um, and sort of going off of that though, a couple people are asking, and this is highlighted best by uh, Joey LaFontaine, um, you know, sometimes folks put information out there that just show who they are, um, and it's not something that folks would ever, um, you know, want to want to restrict. And his question is similar to: uh, we have got a, a bunch of questions on um, folks who are being bullied for their disability, their gender, race, or ethnicity. And then Joey's question: LGBT students and those perceived as being LGBT report far higher percentages of bullying than any other group of students. So how can we make sure that these students are protected? And I would really extend that question to all the other uh, folks from different groups that are asking. Um, this is something I've been working on for a very long time and um, feel very strongly about. I said a while back that if you, take, if you strip away the word bullying, what you get is discrimination and bigotry. That's what this is about. And every person has the right to be treated with dignity, hands down. And to, be, to use words like, you know, I know that use, using words like, that's so gay, or don't be a fag, those kinds of words get thrown around a lot, in, online or not. Let me be really clear with you about this. If you believe that people should be treated with respect, and that people are equal, like you think to yourself, I believe this, people should be treated with respect. If you are using words like gay and fag and other words like that to put people down, that is hypocritical. And it's not just that, oh, it's just what we say. Because the many, one of the things I would like, that I really want young people to do is if you're using that word to put people down, then you are part of degrading people. And so it's not just a word. And it's not just what we do. And it's, oh, not just, oh, you know, we just do this, but I know you guys are really upset about this, you're older mm -hmm. than us. We gotta be really clear, and you gotta look in the mirror about what you really feel about what you stand for. 
And so to really to say the, these words in the LGBTQ community, or to be black or Hispanic or whatever it is that you are or, um, learning disabled or learning different or you have physical differences, anything like that, you always have to remember that you have the right to be treated with dignity and anybody who participates in degrading people based on this, you really have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, do I really believe that it is okay to degrade people? Mm -hmm and have the courage to ask yourself that question. Melody, this, this question um, is, I think, for you, but folks can certainly jump in. Um, from Margaret in Virginia, um, there's more attention that the government's paying to uh, bullying, uh, but sometimes uh, the more attention that's paid, the worse that it gets. Uh, what is the emphasis on restraint of bullying rather than the tools for handling? And I'm going to couple that with another question, uh, Greg and Charlotte, who's asking, are there federal funds that are being made available to, to tackle this issue? Sure. Uh, let's see, both questions. One, I think what we are doing is not exacerbating a problem, but we're in fact shining a light on a problem that already exists. Mm -hmm. And the President and the First Lady want everyone to understand that this is a problem of significance. As we've been talking about, this isn't just a normal mm -hmm. rite of passage. And we understand this, its significance just based on the data and the research. You know, a kid who's a, a bully is more likely by the age of 24 to have engaged in some kind of violent crime. We know that children who are the victims of, of bullying are less likely to do well in school, and we all know the very, very difficult and sad stories about kids who are A students who all of a sudden are D students, and many of them who um, sadly go on to try and hurt themselves, and some of them who even take their lives. This is a very significant problem. So we want people to understand the resources that exist. In fact, today we announced the stopbullying.gov website that amasses all of the information and resources that we have um, and put, makes it more available to students and to parents and others so people have access to it. You know, the wonderful partners that we've been working with, you know, Facebook and MTV here, the research um, by experts like Roslyn and others who have been involved, the PTA, teachers unions and others who are going out into their communities to help parents and teachers and students address this problem. So we want to make sure that people have access to that information. And the second question, Cal, um, that you mentioned that I wanted to respond to. Federal funding? So the other thing, you know, this is actually an issue um, that in federal law there is, are already some resources for. The president, as many of you may know, wants to reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and in doing that to ensure that there are some additional resources, um, but also um, technical assistance for schools so that we can do more research and understand our school climates a little bit better, and that we also can provide information to people so that they can um, tackle this problem within their schools in a better way. So um, not only human resources, but also some additional finan financial resources to build on uh, what has been done in past administrations. Okay. Um, this is a question uh, from uh, Frank De Palmo. Uh, many parents seem unaware that their child could be the one who's bullying others. Um, and some even insist that it's not possible after being told by teachers or school officials. So what can teachers and administrators do to overcome that disconnect? And uh, we've got about five minutes left, so maybe after this we'll take one more question. Thank you. Uh, quite oh, uh, this is a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you get over parental denial? <laughs> um, well, um, as a teacher and as a mom myself, and I've two times in my life, somebody said, is that your child? And I've said, no, because it's, they're not acting in ways that I'm particularly proud of. <laughs> and, um, and I've been to the principal's office already as a parent. <laughs> um, so here's, here's what I, as a teacher, um, I think what's important is to be able to say, when you're approaching the parent, to say, um, and not by email, say, I need to meet with you when and where and you have the parent come in and you say, say one thing that you really like about that kid, one thing, or one thing that you actually really know about that child, and then say exactly what's happening in class that you don't like. But I want you to think about what's the pushback gonna be? What's the parent possibly gonna say that's gonna throw you off track? What I want you to do is, I want, uh, my suggestion is that you say something like, look, my responsibility is to make every child safe in this classroom and feel comfortable, you, your child, and every child. And so I have information that I'm telling you that's important so that you and I can work together so that your child can learn about how to be in the classroom in a more productive way. 
And so that's what I'm doing with you, as I'm reaching out to you in this way. And I, this is hard and it's tough, but I'm gonna be with you every step of the way because I like your kid. And I'm gonna keep working with your kid and we're gonna keep doing this together. So the last question then is, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about what folks can do to empower themselves, what communities and schools can do. A lot of folks are wondering, um, do you all partner with law enforcement entities? Um, and to what extent uh, do all the pieces sort of fit together? Melody, the, uh, you know, the federal funding or the, the policy pieces, for you all the advocacy pieces and, and, and the law enforcement, what's sort of the, um, the strategy to fit those all together to really tackle this issue? Well, I'll just start out by saying that one of the things that we think is very, very important for people to understand is that we don't think that this is a problem that the federal government should dive bomb in and try to fix. We think the federal government can be a partner, but there's so much there's just, there are really wonderful things that are already happening in communities, and we've tried to highlight uh, much of that today. Some of it started by students and parents themselves. So we think that this really is an all hands on deck moment where we are helping to provide resources and data and information. We're reaching out and establishing partnerships with the private sector, and we're also empowering students and teachers and coaches and others so that they can better understand the problem and also how to help resolve it. I think for us and our efforts, we know that we're experts in reaching young people, but we're not experts in the issue. So we bring all those experts together. And I think with the Thin Line campaign, we now have a coalition of upwards of, of 50 organizations that are working on the front lines of all these different issues. From today, we announced new partnerships with the NAACP, La Raza, and GLAAD. Um, we have existing partnerships with people in the relation violent, relationship violence space. Uh, we work with experts in bullying. We work with uh, teachers, people like Common Sense Media, where we can be a rally point. Uh, to bring all that expertise together and, and look at these whole community approaches. And I would say, you know, more than anything, that uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So I think we're really, really interested in the ways that we can educate and, and empower young people through the classroom, through our, our television network, through our website, on, on Facebook and elsewhere, um, and address these issues before they really reach that, that, that critical mass and that critical critical tipping point and where we're really shaping positive social norms that, that say that this is unacceptable behavior and I, I'm re taking responsibility to play a role in making sure that it doesn't, um, that it doesn't manifest, that it doesn't play out. Um, when, what I've been doing is working a lot with district attorneys um, around the country. Just recently I worked in Essex County, Massachusetts with um, district attorney John Blodgett and also I've worked with um, another district attorney in Massachusetts, um, Gerald Leone. And the, I think district attorneys around the country are actually on the forefront of these issues and are able, if any of them are watching right now, um, are able to bring people together, everybody together in very substantive ways in their communities from school resource officers, counselors, school administrators. So I think that the district attorneys are actually at the, are one of these places that we need to really put some attention to because they can get people together. For some reason, they say come to something and they, people come. Right. Joe? I did a presentation recently at a middle school and the, uh, the principal told me afterwards she'd never seen anything like this because when we got to the Q&A and we were talking about online engagement issues and how do these kids interact with each other, literally every kid in the assembly raised his hand and had a question. 600 students, 600 hands up. Wow. It was, it was a, and to be at the front, and <laughs> it took us a long time to answer all the questions. But what the, the number one takeaway from that was we need to have more dialogue like that, that the kids want to have that dialogue, that they were excited and engaged, they would love to talk about these issues, so just right. give them the chance. Uh, at Facebook, we're really focusing on first I'd say the three E, well we say the three E's, education. So we're pulling together a lot of different content from, from the experts to educate people about these issues. Um, secondly, we're trying to promote that engagement in the context of your actions. So when you post something, you know, reminding you to, to act civilly. And then finally, we do want to have that enforcement mechanism. And one thing I have actually found for a teenager threatening to take away their Facebook account uh, is, is actually serious enforcement sometimes. <laughs> so so uh, there's, uh, there's a lot we can do together. Well, well, thank you. And this is about all the time we have uh, for today. Uh, thank you all to the panelists for, for joining us today and, and for the folks at home. Uh, Melody, as you had mentioned, this is uh, certainly not just a federal government issue, but uh, something that we're hoping that you all will continue working on in your communities uh, and at your schools. If you missed any of the conversation today, join us late. You can always watch it at Facebook DC Live or on whitehouse.gov. Thanks so much and have a great afternoon.